In a few years, it had gone from the highest highs to the gutter. 90% of comic book specialty stores in America would be gone. All but one distributor of comics? Gone. Defiant Comics? Gone. Marvel UK? Gone. And the rest? Still reeling. Marvel desperate for ways to pull out of its death spiral. Acclaim buying a company just as the bubble had burst. And at Image? A fracture forming between the partners. Image had started with heated opinions amongst the founders, and yet always solved any issue with a unanimous vote. As they said, everything was either talked to death or worked out. Part of that was that each was in control of their own studio and what it did. If another objected, they might voice it, but that was all it was. There was never the intent of telling someone else what they had to do in their own book. But one of the issues that was really hurting everybody was their chronic lateness. Even the highly disciplined McFarlane succumbed to this at one point, and Eric Larson, who put out his books consistently for a very, very long time, still slipped up on occasion. And there were the gimmicks that were divisive. McFarlane, whose Spider-Man number one had really gotten the whole thing rolling, was the most vocal opponent, while others went for the multi-covers and bagged issues and the like. There was a publisher for Image, Tony Lobito, but he was essentially powerless to fix something that the independent studios all agreed was a problem, but were nevertheless feeling to help. Larry Martyr, himself an artist, was brought in by Valentino to try to wrangle the lunatics who were running the asylum, and according to those involved, he handled it well, starting with a new policy. No book could be solicited unless it was already finished. That would put an end to the damage that Image was unwittingly doing to the very retailers who were making it viable. However, a lot of that damage had already been done, and even Image was feeling it, although not as badly as their recent partners had been. No two ways about it, Deathmate had blown up in Valiant's face, hurting the company's reputation with its audience, and also it's likely that, while Perelman had been dousing the entire industry in gasoline, Deathmate had been the thing to light the match. Acclaim decided that the comics needed to be reworked to improve on the declining sales, and also to better reflect the video game direction that they wanted to take things. So they kicked off Birthquake. It sounds like a serious event, which is why so many fans were confused as to what it actually was, specifically, a non-event. Suddenly in these new books, with the Birthquake announcement on top, the stories and characters were rebooted without explanation. Other titles were just outright cancelled, such as the first Valiant original series, Harbinger. Their plan was typical of Acclaim's seeming approach to business, an idea that sounded terrible that winds up even worse once executed. While cancelling some books, the others were to be twice a month for a while, and big names like Dan Jurgens, Ron Mars, John Estrander, and Bart Sears were lured in with exorbitant salaries. The reasoning was clearly that they had a good product. If they just had top-tier talent and the name recognition of these stars, then the weak books could go and the strong ones would get that much stronger. But Acclaim had severely misjudged the situation. Bob Layton had become frustrated with the whole thing, where he felt that he had no creative control, hence the valiant line going from a singular vision to a disparate mess. Like many of the fans themselves, and for largely the same reasons, Leighton had given up on Valiant, because it wasn't the same Valiant anymore. Behind the scenes, it was a new company, and in the books, the familiar characters were brand new people. Sales rose, but barely. Certainly not to cover paying $20,000 per issue just for the penciler. Sure enough, like at Marvel, there were layoffs six months after Birthquake, and worse, the high-priced talent was under contract, so despite the huge piles of cash flying out of the Valiant office... Valiant's homegrown creators were the ones who were being shown the door. They also began a second imprint with Valiant, Armada, which dealt with licensed comics. You might remember that licensed comics were where Valiant had started on the wrong foot. Well, this at least tied a bit closer to the comic book audience, with science fiction titles like Sliders. But the most well-known was based upon the new arrival in the comic book shop, Magic the Gathering. Magic had emerged slowly in 1993, but by summer of 95, it had broken out across the country and was providing an alternate form of entertainment for fans who were annoyed with the various money-making schemes going on. So a Magic comic actually made a lot of sense. It could be sold right next to the cards in many cases, the world of Magic offered numerous story opportunities to be explored, and a significant percentage of the players were current or former comic fans, one of whom was Richard Garfield, the creator of the game. 
After the success of the original set of Magic, work was underway on Ice Age, but a long way off, and Wizards of the Coast, which made Magic, wanted a new expansion right away. Well, Garfield had just read issue 50 of Neil Gaiman's Sandman, Ramadan, and took it as a sign, and thus the first Magic expansion, Arabian Nights, was created, including a nod to the inspirational issue with the card sitting in a bottle that the glamour of this culture would forever live on in dreams and stories. So the overlap between Players of Magic and Readers of Comics was obvious and a real opportunity for Valiant. But alas, this lasted a scant 15 months before the run drew to a close. By now, Acclaim had realized just how horribly they had screwed things up. Masarski tried to lure Leighton back as editorial manager at triple his old salary and a house. And he accepted for about an hour before he thought about it and realized it would be a huge mistake. This was all actually part of a plan on how to resolve the birthquake mess, see. So when Leighton declined, they appointed Fabian Nisienza as editor-in-chief, which they then used as an excuse to shut down Valiant Comics in late 1996 and then launch Acclaim Comics. By doing this, those expensive contracts would be canceled and naturally the Valiant characters would once again be rebooted to even more emphasize their role as video game fodder, and naturally further frustrating for the dwindling Valiant audience. Now, I don't want to give the impression that Acclaim Comics was nothing but a sea of dreck. There were some hits there, Quantum and Woody being a substantial one. It was co-created by Mark Bright, an artist whose work included the famous Shockwave cover of The Transformers No. 5, and Christopher Priest, a longtime Marvel scribe who had been one of the original planners of Milestone Media. Milestone published through DC with the intent of introducing more minority superheroes and produced comics for four years, but this ran up against the blossoming image and valiant universes. Despite that problem, the issues actually sold quite well, relatively speaking, especially when you consider that early impressions were that minorities were the target audience for these books. But nevertheless, for a new universe of books being dropped into a flooded marketplace, they did surprisingly well especially given the amount of creators who were brand new to the industry and thus lacked the name recognition that Image, Valiant, and even Malibu had. But when the bubble burst, sales did poorly and they effectively ceased to exist as a comic publisher, though their characters were eventually incorporated into the DC Universe. I should note that one huge success for Milestone, Static Shock, was eventually turned into an animated series and frequently crossed over with the DCAU. Back at Image, where they were finally getting things together, one figure was pulling in the wrong direction. And you can probably guess which one I mean. Yes, Rob Liefeld. He had created maximum press for work outside of Image, which was in itself fine, except for the other things that were going on. Against all reason, Liefeld had been given the responsibilities of handling Image's finances and such, and I say that because he was notorious for falling asleep during business meetings. Liefeld is alleged to have used image funds to cover personal debts and the image personnel and resources to promote and do production work for Maximum Press. He was also accused of copying pre-production artwork for his books, stealing artists from other studios in the company, of not paying the artists in his employ, and of using image as leverage in order to get credit lines for Maximum Press. All this combined with even more questionable business practices eventually led to Silvestri pulling Top Cow out of image. Finally, having had enough, the partners agreed unanimously, except for Liefeld obviously, to take away his authority and remove him from image. Liefeld protested that he hadn't been given sufficient notice on this issue, so they agreed to hold the vote again a month later. Liefeld then issued a letter of resignation before they officially fired him and announced that he was regretfully leaving, while image put out their own statement saying no, his ass has been fired. Lawsuits shot around, but in the end, Silvestri brought Top Cow back to Image, and Liefeld created a new company, Awesome Comics, because Rob Liefeld is a 12-year-old boy trapped in a 15-year-old boy's body. But if you thought things were ugly between a collection of artists, imagine how it was between Wall Street giants. Marvel wasn't just struggling like the rest of the business. They were in serious trouble, because Perelman had tried turning the little comic book company into an empire. That's how an unexpected player would soon enter the mess that the comic book industry had found itself in, and it was from someone completely outside of it. If you're older, you might remember the Remington commercials with Victor Kayam proudly touting, I liked it so much I bought the company. 
Well, Ike Perlmutter, the guy who bought Remington when I guess Victor stopped liking it so much, his part in this was that he owned Toy Biz, originally a small-time toy company that he bought and renamed and eventually owned in partnership with Avi Arad. Toy Biz was doing mm, all right, but nothing exceptional. One thing that Perlmutter noted was that tie-in toys were the big sellers, but the license fees meant that a small-time operation like his could never compete with companies like Hasbro and Mattel. Well, through a friend of a friend, Perlmutter learned about the Wizards' plan to turn Marvel into a mini Disney and decided to take a chance. He made an offer to Perlman, a huge amount of control over Toy Biz, effectively making it part of the Marvel family, and in return, Toy Biz gets the exclusive rights to make Marvel-based toys, license-free, forever. For Marvel, it was a rather unsound move, but for Perlman personally, it was a sweet deal, so in early 1993, before the bubble had burst, the deal happened. When everything else at Marvel was falling apart, Toy Biz was still managing to stay afloat. Marvel owed the bank $700 million, not to mention the massive debt for all of those bonds. Panini failed to recover. The comic sales failed to recover. Licensed property revenue was down. The Fleer Skybox merger hemorrhaged money instead of making it, thanks to a boneheaded minimum license fee from the NBA, rather than a share of the sales. Marvel had become a first-class disaster under Perlman's ownership. So, in keeping with his frequent chukspa, Perlman cooked up a plan to save Marvel by buying Toy Biz outright and making it a wholly owned Marvel property in a move that required giving himself even greater control over all the properties and also of maximizing the pissing off of everyone else involved. He would invest $350 million in this venture, and in return, more stock in Marvel would be created, which he would then get. Now, obviously, if the number of shares increases, then the value of each individual share is going to decrease. So not only would this diminish the value of the shareholder's stock, it was also giving Perelman stock at $0.85 cents each, even though the stock was trading at that time for over $3.00. The bondholders likewise got screwed. They were to receive the collateral, which was shares of Marvel, which were worth a tenth of what they had been worth when they were offered as collateral, and as we've established, about to be even further diluted. And after they got that pittance, the bonds would then be rendered worthless. At a conference to try to sell the deal, the question was raised of whether they'd looked at selling Marvel to a big-name media company. And the answer was they'd already tried that. They'd been trying for two years. But it seems that that deal with Toy Biz, about exclusive rights until the earth fell into the sun, turned potential buyers off. It was actually losing Marvel more money than it was making. There was no other way out. It was either Perelman's plan or risk getting nothing at all. But that's when Carl Icahn entered the picture one corporate shark eyeing another. Icon was, in fact, one of the inspirations for Gordon Gecko in the film Wall Street, so you can imagine what we're dealing with here. He was convinced that Perlman wouldn't make this move unless he knew something that everybody else didn't, some secret part of this mess that was going to make him even richer. And looking at the Toy Biz plan and what it would leave him suggested that Perlman's people were deliberately exaggerating Marvel's financial woes in order to clean up in the long run comparing Perelman to a plumber who screws up a mansion and then acts like he's being charitable buying the place for the price of a cottage. So Icon quietly began buying up those bonds until he controlled a third of them. Then he formed a committee of other bondholders with the ultimate intent of getting control of Marvel away from Perelman and for himself. In a public statement, he fired a warning shot across Perelman's throat, a proposal that would match Perelman's own, except it left the wizard with nothing. Perelman's squeeze play had wound up blowing up in his face, and Perelman found himself backed into a corner, with the only option left. Marvel would officially go bankrupt. We'll explore that in our next chapter, Verses.